I don't have time. For some people, that is just a training excuse. But for others, it isn't. It is a genuine challenge that people need to face when programming their training. I remember finishing work, getting on a jammed public transport, stopping a few stops early from home, going to a crowded gym at 5.30, struggling to try and find a free area to train, getting back on public transport, getting home, feeling exhausted, having to do things when you get home. That's the reality for many people. Whereas fitness celebrities essentially have all day to fit around their training because their training is literally their job. For most people, they have to fit their training around their job. That is the disconnect. Another scenario now is obviously with what's happening in the world that some gyms may actually limit the time that people can spend in there. Some gyms may have sort of awkward opening hours, for example. And so this video is here to connect you to an evidence base for strategies that you can use if time is a real factor that faces you for your programming. And this piece of research is very new from 2021. In the exercise science playlist, I'm essentially focusing now on new and emerging high quality pieces of research. And so I could spend hours talking about this research paper, but what I try to do is make it as surgical as possible, as simple and as digestible as possible, so you can take the information away today. However, ironically, in a video about time-saving strategies, this video is quite long. And these are the topics that I will cover. I've timestamped everything, so you may want to just look at a few concepts today and Maybe you'll circle back later to look at the other concepts. I don't know. What I'm presenting in this paper are not the best strategies for training per se. These are considerations when the time availability you have for training is fairly limited. Exercise selection. And so here's table one, which is a brief summary of the concepts involved that you can screenshot and read. What should you train is interesting. Perform at least one lower body exercise and one pulling and one pushing exercise for the upper body, preferably bilateral multi-joint exercises. For example, the leg press, seated row, and bench press, which leads us to variable one, multi-joint and single joint exercises. If limited on time, of course, getting the most bang for your buck from exercises is vital. And therefore your exercises involving multiple joints and muscles at the same time make sense the compound exercises. The role of single joint exercises remains equivocal and further research is needed to better understand their impact on long-term hypertrophic responses, where the response varies between muscles, even portions of the muscles, and individuals with different training status, and the extent to which they provide functional and or sport specific enhancements. And so single joint exercises do have their place of course, but for time efficient training, this quote is highly applicable. Thus, for those seeking time efficiency in their workouts, we recommend prioritizing multi-joint exercises as the greater amount of muscle mass trained allows for shorter training sessions, despite the somewhat longer recovery needed between sets to accommodate higher levels of exertion. Next variable, free weights and machines. So how do you train these compound movements? Well, we know we have multiple tools available to us in the gym, multiple pieces of equipment. It's not necessarily that one piece of equipment is better than the other. They're just different and they have benefits and disadvantages that you have to apply to your needs. The main difference between modalities is that it is easier to stimulate real life movements and sport specific movements with free weights compared to most machines, which usually have limited adaptability of the movement pattern. However, the variety of machines is vast, with some allowing for training in a manner very similar to free weights. And so machines do have certain benefits, including training with machines facilitates the use of very heavy loads and training to muscular failure without the need for a spotter, which may be especially beneficial for inexperienced lifters. And so then when we think about free weights, we most commonly have dumbbells versus barbells. When synthesizing the body of literature, training with a barbell allows for a higher total muscle activation and an ability to lift heavier weights compared to dumbbells. While dumbbell exercises can be good for targeting specific muscles and provide a freer range of motion, which in some cases can be desirable, it would seem that training with a barbell is the more time efficient option. In our opinion, the decision as to whether barbells should be prioritized over machines would need to take several factors into account, e.g. available equipment, lifting experience, or the availability of competent instructors. And so you can use machines, free weights, or a mixture of both, and those are some considerations for you. Next variable, bilateral and unilateral exercises. Are you gonna use unilateral exercises, which essentially means using one side of the body, for example, a split squat, or are you gonna use bilateral exercises, for example, a barbell back squat, where you're using both sides of that lower body? And in this study, the researchers explain that bilateral exercises have higher stability, 
and therefore more muscle mass involvement. And therefore you can use a heavier weight and a greater force output with bilateral exercises. Considering the current evidence, we propose that bilateral exercises are more time efficient since both sides of the body are trained simultaneously and thus should be prioritized unless core activation is central to a person's training goal. That said, unilateral training is a viable option to increase the difficulty of an exercise in situations where less weight is available, such as during home-based training. And that leads us on to the next variable, body weight training. Calisthenics can be an invaluable tool for people who are pressed for time because essentially you can do them anywhere. And so that gives you greater flexibility as to when and where you can perform your session to fit it around your day. There is compelling evidence that a small number of upper body body weight exercises can be effective strength training alternatives, such as the pull up, chin up and push up. However, little research has been carried out on body weight exercise for the lower limbs. And so those large compound body weight calisthenic movements, the pull ups, the push ups, the classics, the standard exercises, which are still absolutely fantastic. And so here's one life example for you when I was training in that gym sort of at 5 30 p.m when it's absolutely packed getting on the lap pull down machine was essentially impossible however the pull-up bar nice and freely available to use the next variable muscle action so at this point let's think about muscle contraction with your training you have the concentric phase you have the eccentric phase you have isometric contractions I've talked about these in depth on my channel before if you are pressed for time you are most likely not going to be performing isometric exercises or eccentric loading for example you're going to hit the compound standard dynamic contraction, concentric and eccentric for effectiveness and efficiency. Dynamic muscle actions coupling concentric eccentric movements should be employed for time efficiency. The next variable, repetition velocity. How fast are you performing your reps? The tempo of your reps? I have a video dedicated to that. But if your context is you don't have a lot of time to train, then of course, a large time under tension would not be suitable. Time under tension is a tool you may use for in your training where you have a slower tempo through the eccentric phase. But as I said, if you're time pressed, probably not for you. You can just perform dynamic contractions with a slightly faster tempo with a good challenging load for your rep range and that's absolutely valid. In summary, a wide range of repetition velocities can be utilized to induce muscular adaptations and manipulation of this variable is unlikely to markedly influence changes in muscle growth. As a general rule, a somewhat faster repetition cadence should be employed when time is of essence. And so let's get on to the advanced time-saving methods. We have supersets. Since this method substantially limits the time spent at rest, it allows for a greater training density, performing more exercise in a short amount of time compared to traditional strength training. Again, I have a video on supersets which goes into more depth. And for those of you who are new to supersets, it basically means you do one exercise immediately followed by the other. And so here's an example given in the research comparing superset structure to traditional set structure. For anyone new to this topic, you may want to just screenshot that so you can understand the differences. And also it's important to understand there are different ways that you can perform supersets. Supersets can be performed by pairing exercises for the same muscle group, e.g. bench press and flies, or by pairing exercises for different muscle groups, e.g. bicep curls and tricep pushdown. That last method is known as the agonist antagonist superset method, which is perhaps the most commonly used. When you have a superset method using the same muscle group for both exercises, the research paper states that that's more perhaps used by bodybuilders. Next strategy, drop sets. Complete it may. The strategy involves performing a traditional set, reducing the load, and then immediately performing another set or multiple sets. Typically, one to three drops are used with a 20 to 25% reduction in weight, with all sets performed to muscular failure. And so I have an in-depth video on that, but this is a nice summary of drop sets. Despite the limited evidence, drop set training seems to allow for shorter duration workouts with little or no reduction in training volume or training responses, especially hypertrophy, thus making it a viable training method for those who are time pressed to train. It should also also be noted that most of the studies on the topic were carried out using single joint upper body exercises. A recent review stated that while drop sets can be used for both single joint and multi-joint exercises, the strategy is most suited to single joint training from a practical perspective. Due to safety concerns, it might not be advisable to include drop sets in certain compound free weight exercises such as squats. A dose of common sense for safety there, which is, in my opinion, the most important thing with any of your training is safety. And so considering the fact that we've established that bilateral multi-joint exercises are highly time efficient. If you do choose that you want to use drop sets with these exercises, then perhaps you may
may consider using machines as a form of safety. And to the last strategy, rest pause training. The rest pause method is a method of structuring sets where normal interset rest periods are accompanied by pre-planned rest within training sets. During rest pause training, sets are segmented into smaller sets with short breaks in between, which are commonly performed in one or two ways. The first approach involves performing four to six sets of single repetitions using a load close to one rep max, while the second approach involves performing one set to failure, interset rest, often 20 seconds, new set to failure, interset rest, etc., until the pre planned number of reps are performed. And because there haven't been enough quotes in this video already, stay with me, here's another one. The level of evidence for the rest pause method remains equivocal, and more research is needed to draw firm conclusions as to its effects on muscular adaptation. Still, when time is a barrier to training, the rest pause method appears to be an efficient method for improving both strength and especially hypertrophy. It should though be mentioned that the rest pause method to, of training is very intense and some training experience is probably required to train this way in a safe manner, especially when performing complex multi-joint free weight exercises. Again, when I say apply to yourself, there's the training spectrum. Are you a beginner, intermediate, advanced? If you're a beginner, you're not gonna use rest pause, for example. And so in the practical application, the researchers state that really, despite everything they've, they've put at you, that specificity and progressive overload are still king. They're still the absolutely vital underlying principles. So regardless of your exercise selection and the way you structure, you're using supersets, drop sets, whatever you may choose, you have to have the progressive overload in there. You have to have the specificity towards your goals. Those with limited time for training should aim to train with greater or equal to four weekly sets per muscle group using a six to 15 loading range. If training is performed to volitional failure, a 15 to 40 rep range can also be employed. By performing bilateral multi-joint exercises, all major muscle groups can be targeted with as few as three exercises, i.e. leg pressing exercise, an upper body pushing exercise, and an upper body pulling exercise. For example, leg press, bench press, and seated rows. Training can be performed in one or several shorter sessions, whatever suits the individual. Additionally, advanced training techniques such as drop sets, rest pause training, and supersets can be used to increase training volume in a more time efficient fashion. To further reduce training time, individuals could abstain from stretching and a general warm up and limit the specific warm up to the first exercise for each muscle group. And so my mouth is as dry as the Sahara. I'm James Linker. I hope this was useful for you. I know it's a bit heavy. I know it's a bit quote heavy, but there are so many concepts in one video for you to take and for you to think about and to work through and to think about with your programming and to discard some of it or to apply some of it and to, to think critically, which ultimately I just hope will help people. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you soon.